Hello and welcome to the Real Estate Nerds Podcast. On this Bad Beats episode, we will explore the human side of real estate investing with a seasoned pro about to make the legendary worst deal of their life. A deal isn't just the investment, it is also the person. Stay with us and learn what it takes to be the best investor. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Nerds Podcast. I am your host, Scott Royal Smith. I'm the owner of Royal Legal Solutions, your one stop shop for everything real estate, asset protection, tax, legal advice, um, anything related to that. Royal Legal Solutions, we got you here. I'm here with Rebecca uh, today. Rebecca um, is a very uh, sparkly personality and overall a fellow attorney and wonderful uh, person. She's a JD and LLM. Uh, she's also a certified uh, financial planner, I believe. And um, Rebecca, thank you so much for coming on the show today. So great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I think today we're going to be talking about a worst deal, which I got to preface for everybody here. This is something that you'll never hear uh, lawyers want to talk about, right? Like lawyers, we are the people that are like, we want to come forward, everybody be like, we're perfect. We've never made a mistake. I can't believe you would possibly ever accuse me of making a mistake. Everything I've always done is always the best, right? And I think that's, you know, part of that is one of the reasons why most attorneys get like this perception of being like so rigid and have to be inside of the box so much because they're like, I have to have this perfect image for anybody to, to like me. And then, but among like professionals, um, and one of the things that I want to have insight for you guys here today is that. Uh, lawyers, we're in a business just like anybody else, right? And we're advising people to always the best of our knowledge. And that doesn't always mean that everything goes, you know, a thousand percent correct um, with everything that we do, because just like everybody else, we're acting on the best information we have, and we have a method and a process um, that you do with that. And so today, when we're talking about today's worst deal, this is actually a very uh, special opportunity um, for you guys to be able to hear what it's like for two lawyers to be kvetching in a sense about what happens when things don't go perfect and other people are depending on you for it because those are your clients and they're paying you to do it and, and really coming to grips with the fact that, you know what, nobody's actually perfect a thousand percent of the time and we're all, uh, you know, working on the best information we have. So Rebecca, um, before we jump into, um, into the specifics of the deal itself. Can, uh, can you give us just a brief background on, on what's going on and, you know, what's going on with Rebecca and Rebecca's world uh, that kind of set the stage for, you know, what you're, who you are and, and what's going on in those moments of your life before you're starting to go down like the decision path of, of what ends up being this worst deal? Yes, absolutely, Scott. Thank you for that. Um, so my background is really unique. I, I'm really kind of similar to you in the sense that I am a lawyer, but you know, we, we do so much more with our practice. It's not just the focus of law, it's the law where and the law where the law really intersects with, you know, building wealth. Um, so my background is really unique in the sense that I uh, graduated with undergrad in finance and I worked in finance for slightly over a decade. Uh, I, at 22 years old, was working for the managing partner of financial services for uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers based in London. So I got some really great, excellent international and domestic financial experience and did that for a while. And then after about a little over a decade, I went to law school, University of Florida, and uh, did really well there. And then I went on to NYU to get my LLM. A lot of people don't know what an LLM is. So that is obviously, as you know, Scott, my advanced law degree in taxation, federal taxation. And um, then I came back to Florida and I practice at a boutique law firm where we were really working with high net worth individuals uh, on you know, legal, legal tax minimization strategies of the estate, of income tax, all of those things. And I had like an epiphany moment because I was in a boardroom with a client and you know the, the client was at the head of his boardroom or at his office and his financial advisor was on one side of the table and I'm on the other side and they both just know that I'm the tax lawyer. That's all they know about me, right? And his advisor starts talking first, and I could literally feel my ears turning red, literally. Like, I just, this was like the worst possible financial advice this gentleman was giving. And I had on heels, and I remember digging my heels into the carpet and telling myself, you're just here as a tax attorney, you're just here as a tax attorney, you're just here as a tax attorney. And I knew instantly at that moment that that was just not going to work out for me. I was going to have to basically open my own practice and really marry my love of finance with my love of law. 
and uh, have my own sort of holistic practice. And so I've been doing that for four years now. I wrote my first book. It came out in January of this year. And uh, we've been doing a, a book tour across the country. It's been going really, really well. And um, that's basically, that's me. Now, that's awesome, Rebecca. I, I think it's like one of those pieces, right, is that you have to know like where you, you fit in, you know? And sometimes uh, I think that's one of the, the journeys that we all get on, which is saying like, you know, we get into a new position, we, we look at it and we say, well, I, I don't fit here. Actually, I need to go create something else. So actually I can fit into, you know, all the pieces that you need to be doing. Cause obviously just being a tax attorney wasn't enough, you know, like you needed to be at a different level of the game uh, to be able to be happy. And it seems like now you've, you found a good spot for you, um, you know, that you're working through. Um, and so when you're, when you're looking at, you know, the, the work, this worst deal or, or this, bad deal that we're going to be talking about here today. Can you set the stage for us? But that I know it involves some, some IRA work, but how did that come about? Um, yeah. So in my practice, my practice is Walter Wealth Management and mm -hmm. we really approach building wealth sort of like you do, where we're not just looking at it from the conventional financial perspective, but we're also looking at it from the legal perspective and really from the tax perspective, which I find is um, I write the book and their book talks about the two biggest uh, threats to wealth building. Uh, the first threat being really market volatility, what I call the new normal, this new normal of super high highs followed by extreme low lows. Um, because if you're just doing a stock portfolio, which obviously your people aren't because they're in real estate, but most of America believes that the market is the place for them to grow their wealth. And while it does work over the long term, and it's a beautiful thing over the long term, when you're at and you're in retirement, which I ascribe as 10 years uh, before retirement or in retirement, when you're at that point in your life, your investment life cycle has changed so much that what volatility really becomes a mathematical, statistical deal killer, wealth killer. So the first half of my book, I talk about that. The second half of my book, I talk about the tax, that I really see tax and the coming tax problem as the largest threat to w building and keeping, more importantly, keeping your wealth for the rest of your life. So in sort of my book, that is my practice. We, we have clients that come in and they feel like, you know, the news that they're hearing or the conventional advice that they're getting to just maximize their 401k or IRA while they're still working is just sort of missing the boat. Something just doesn't sit right with them and they think, something else has got to be going on here. And um, they come to us looking for some kind of different perspective. Our practice is unique in that not only are we really looking to help them build the wealth from a, from a numbers perspective financially, but we're also making sure that the wealth is built in the right tax bucket. Since tax is going to be such an integral, probably the most important role in the coming years, um, we make sure that the wealth is built in the right tax bucket. And so that's really where um, clients are coming to us looking for more of a, a total approach um, from both a tax perspective and an actual traditional wealth building perspective. And so from that, you know, we've had uh, clients that have come to us and said, hey, I've got an IRA. I I've got this. I've got that. You talk about the market is, you know, up. The market is down. Market volatility is a problem. And I talk in my book about real estate and how over the history of time, real estate is one of the, the most um, kept up asset from an inflation perspective. It's a long-term great uh, strategy to build and create wealth. And so from that, you know, a lot of clients want a turnkey sort of solution to building wealth or utilizing the self-directed IRA in the real estate space. And so from that, Scott, you know, when we, we first started out years ago, we were, you know, we were testing the waters, so to speak, of what kind of provider was going to be able to give a turnkey solution to our clients. Um, so, you know, you've got a client who hears a commercial or sees something or hears a podcast randomly about self-directed IRA or owning real estate inside your IRA, and they don't know how that's possible. And so, obviously, you really need sort of a, a turnkey solution provider to give you all that, because it's a very nuanced area. I mean, you know, you can, you can literally just practice self-directed IRA, right? It's so, yeah, it's so definitely guys that do that, right? That they just do IRAs and 401ks and then talk about like what all the prohibited transactions you can do or whatnot. But it sounded like what you were guys were trying to do was something a little different saying like, we'll help you um, navigate what you need to be doing for the custodian as part of your self-directed IRA. And then we're also going to be pairing you guys with like a turnkey type of investment solution, right? 
That's exactly what we did. We, at, when we first started, we, we found um, a, a group that had been doing it for many, many years, had won awards from NASDAQ and, you know, had been really highly recommended. And, and we worked with them, with our clients to establish self-directed IRAs, to really roll, do the rollovers, to get the money with the custodian, and then to actually find the deals um, to do multifamily or, you know, and rental investments with um, where they put the actual financing together. They put the, the property management together. They put everything really all together. And it was overall a really good experience. But I will say that the one downside, the heartache of, the, of, of some of the deals is, is the on the ground property management. You know, you think that you're pairing with a group that has been doing this and they, they've got everything together. But what you start to realize is if the on the ground management, and these deals were all over the country. So you, you have different on the ground managers all over the country, right? If your on the ground management is not, you know, very good at getting um, a, a slow pay tenant out or doing a tenant turnover or, you know, going in and, and refurbishing after a tenant leaves or, you know, finding a new tenant right away or um, collecting rent or getting, you know, get, you know if they're, they're too high on expenses, like if the the maintenance expenses are supposed to be this percentage or around about this range and they're just excessively high. Why are they high all the time? Why are we paying for these? So we just got into this quagmire level of details that all really circle around the on the ground property manager. And when you're, when you have clients that are looking for a turnkey sort of solution inside of a self-directed IRA, they're really looking for something that is like a stock or a bond that they just, they don't have to worry about or fiddle with. Right. And the one thing about real estate is that you know, it is a little bit different. There is a little bit more involvement, even though you have these other groups involved. So that's where it really becomes key, Scott, that you have just great on the ground property management that is really active and really knows what they're doing and is really proficient at doing it and has been doing it a long time so that you can just really avoid the stressors that come with uh, property managers that are really shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. And well, I was wondering with that too, is that, so in terms of when you guys are vetting, sounds like you, you've edited the company and said, hey, well, this is actually, you know, they're nationally recognized, they're obviously very popular, or they're a large company. They should be great, right? Because like how else could be they be that big and skate by with having really subpar performance. Um, but that was also part of it is that you guys probably vetted that company, but probably, I mean, I, I don't know if I was in your position. I don't think it would ever cross my mind to be like, hey, let me call up all of your property managers. That would be ridiculous, right? Exactly. So what do you do when you're approaching a problem like that moving forward? Um, because like, there's going to be positions where you, you run into the same type of decision, right? Where it's going to be like, hey, do I hire this major company? Who are they going to be outsourcing basically the work to? In this case, it would be like property managers. Um, and is that something that's just purely contractual that you would have said, Hey, that's where I should look at this is I should have had better SLAs with what guarantees they're going to make around what returns are going to be there and build those in on the front end uh, to think through like, Hey, this could be, you know, this, this could all fall apart. Is that way you kind of like adapt to like the learning moment from that experience or was there something else that you guys do to adapt to that kind of decision moving forward? Well, you know, the thing with us is obviously, and I'm sure with you as well, is you, you continuously, that's still a client of ours, even though we referred them out to this third party group for this particular financial solution that we don't offer in-house. So it was really more of us referring to a third party group that, that we vetted clearly, but still the recommendation being made to the group is, is on us, right? And so we're not going to ever leave our clients in a lurch, even though this is not within our purview or, or even our, you know, control, which is really even more frustrating, right? You know, Scott, because you're like, um, you know, it's your client, you're making a recommendation after all the vetting that you've done. And then after that, it's sort of beyond your control. It's what, what's happening with that company and that investment and that particular. So yeah, I think it's, it's just recognizing that when you're dealing with real estate and if you're dealing with, and there's a, there's a lot of, there's several of these companies out there, right? If you're dealing with real estate and you're thinking self-directed IRA and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to go with this particular company and I'm going to, you know, um, basically, you, you know, do this turnkey solution. Just remember that it is beyond just that particular company. It's the actual, where is the property that I'm buying and what property manager's there. And it's just something that obviously just does not normally come up. And so I thought it would be a really great point to reference in your real estate podcast with people that are thinking of these, these, these new kind of unique new solutions that we've got um, that are expanding the breadth of opportunity for retirement options, right? It's just something that we, we have sort of learned to, to make sure that you do get that service level agreement 
agreement in place and you do understand expectations. And even the client can just have level set expectations because that's the one thing that I think people don't understand is especially when you're dealing with a company that says, well, we like to be, have it be like a stock or a bond. It's not. At the end of the day, it's real estate. And there are very unique problems to real estate. I mean, we had clients, a lot of clients go through the hurricanes, you know, and in Houston and in Florida and even Alabama. And those things in, involve insurance deductibles. And these are just the perils of dealing with real estate that people have to accept the the not so fun with the really fun, great returns that they can get, you know, and the cash flow they can get. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true, right? I think a lot of it, I mean, I think comes down to what the expectations are, right? If it was a stock or a bond and it lost money, everybody would be like, ah, it lost money. Okay, well, I guess I'll pull them out of that and I'll go into something else, right? Because the perception is, is that with a stock or a bond, I can't influence any change. I think there's a perception here with this that type of investment, though, that people are coming to it and say like, oh, no, no, actually, I can influence change. And so then I'm going to get really upset when things don't work out the way that I want to, because I can actually do something about it, like putting leverage on Rebecca. So that way she'll put leverage on the property managers to make sure the returns go up. And then if it's not hitting exactly what I want, I can do all of these things. Right. So there's there's a there's a difference into that mainly because purely based upon what the expectation is that somebody would lose money in a stock market and not bat an eye about it because they'd say, oh, okay, well, that's what happened with that fund, that real estate investment fund. Well, could you do any of that now? All right. So I'll just walk away from it. I mean, and I think it also becomes what's really interesting part of this too is from um, like, we can understand that as an intellectual exercise of saying like, why are you treating these two investments so differently client? you know, but really both of them are out of your hands. You've really outsourced both of them. And they're both going to work out or not work out on whatever level they're going to. Um, but then, then your job becomes really interesting, just like a lot of our listeners do that manage funds for people and saying like, we have an expectation that things are going to work out because that's always our expectations when we go into a new deal. Um, and, and what do you, how does that work for, for you? Just like works out for a lot of other people to, to you know, um, you know, in a sense, kind of like repair, rebuild, and, and strengthen those relationships when something doesn't work out right. Do you get, do you have like a specific game plan of how do you approach um, those types of interactions with people when things don't go out the way that what you plan them to? Yeah, I think it's a matter of learning through the from the things that happen in life. It's life experiences, as you said, and and so in in our particular situation, you know, if it were just a if it was just a market based investment, you know, clearly there's so many, um, you know, disclosures ahead of time that there's no guarantee of any kind of performance here, and you know, past performance doesn't guarantee future performance, and all those things. But what you do inside of the regular market, stock bond, any variation thereof, world mutual funds, ETFs, whatever, is you you start to say, okay, what is our long term strategy and is this a situation right now that's happening that is so opposed to our long term strategy that we need to just basically cut bait and get out and move on right and just got to cut our losses and reconfigure and go from there um, when you're dealing with something more like self-directed IRA and real estate, I think our approach has been what can we do to help resolve the situation um, as far as that is humanly possible and at the point where it's just not salvageable or it's just not something we want to be in, it's the same. It, the, the answer at the end of the day is the same as any other investment. It's not meeting our long-term needs here and we're going to, unfortunately, that's not what we expected, but that's it, the reality and we're going to have to cut bait and move on and recalibrate. And so, you know, it's it's it takes a little bit longer to get to that point, you know, Scott, because there are things that you feel like you can do to sort of have an influence on the property management on the ground and who they are and can we change them. So there are maybe a little few more iterations that you go through before you just decide to, you know, make a disinterested decision to sell or not sell. Um, so it does seem to take a little bit longer than that. But at the end of the day, you're actually de dead right when you talk about you should be looking at this from a perspective of, at like any other investment and either it's working or it's not either it's fitting into our picture or it's not and and then deciding from there so how does that work for um you know how, how does it work in terms of, of um like a client management perspective right because you know a lot of people, right? We have a ton of we have a ton of listeners, right? And I have a ton of clients that have you know small funds, like five, ten million dollar funds that they use for real estate. And not every one of those deals works out. And like, there's a lot of times when deals aren't working out that they're coming to me and saying, "Hey, Scott, like, how do I actually communicate this back to my my base, right? That are all the fundraisers? Because right now we had this you know whole piece to it. It didn't work out. Obviously, they're questioning you know trust in me. You know, do I have the right judgment because I was the one that promoted this deal and blah 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 blah, 
right? Um, I imagine that when something goes sideways and, and with work that you guys do, that you guys are conscious of the same type of problem. I'm yeah. saying, okay, well, we need to make sure that we're re-strengthening up these relationships with people. Um, and, and typically what I've heard um, to be really effective in the past, and I was wondering if you get, if you have a particular strategy that you use for that is, um, uh, what these guys have done is say, we do high transparency about the problem and then we do frequent touch points, like short frequent touch points with people because that helps them rebuild the trust and helps them feel that we're connected to them and having the, this relationship where we're really having their best interest in mind. We're not just you know, grinding through the paperwork. That's what's worked for a lot of people I work with. I was wondering if you guys do something that's different or have a different take on that. No, I actually think you're exact. That's if you had asked me without saying that first, I would tell you that exactly that is I think that so many people, especially people of responsibility with of other people, people's money, right? So we have other people's money that we are responsible for. So your fund managers, people like me, people like you that are recommending certain things. We have this certain level of responsibility and sometimes, certainly not me, but there's a tendency, I think, in the, in the world really and in America to sort of not want to face something head on, you know, that's not like, that's what the lawyer would do, but that's not what your average person is going to do. They, they just want to like, let it linger and let it fester and, um, think that maybe it'll calm down a little bit, or that's kind of maybe the mental philosophy of let, it, let everything sort of settle and then we'll address it. Um, and I think that, you know, it's just the opposite. You have to let your clients know that you're in the trenches and you're working on it. And then when, when you come to the resolution that it's time to move on, you have to communicate clearly why, how we got to this point with a measured thought that went behind, you know, the action plan that we're laying out. And then you have to do exactly that. When you lay out the action plan, you keep them involved and you keep them touched of, you know, up to speed of what's going on so that they can sort of feel like, um, you know, that they're, they're not being left, right, Scott? But the, the one thing that I would say is a caution, especially to your fund managers, you know, and it's probably a little bit different for them um, because they are the ones that made those decisions and they are the ones that are you know, like pulling them out, uh, the clients out or whatever, or the positions out or whatever that, is that they're doing. But from our perspective, it's a little bit different because we were sort of the recommender and it was a third party, right? So we're trying to get like reintroject ourselves and sort of extract problems from our clients that are not really something that we can control. So it's a little bit different because you don't want to get so involved that they think now you're taking responsibility for somebody else's mess. You want to help them get out of it, but at the same time, not to the point that they expect or think that it's your issue. You know, it's your problem that you're fixing because yeah. it's, it's not. That's really important, right? Because now you're going to get blamed for something that you can't really control, right? Right. So how do you, how do, you do that? Is that part of just the communication of saying, hey, listen, we're not taking on, we're, we're coming here to help you, but we're not taking on the responsibility of, of the investment itself, something like that? Or what do you, how do you navigate that water, Rebecca? You know, again, I think it's just full transparency of saying, you know, this is a recommendation that was made. This is a third party that, that, that we have no control over, although we have worked behind the scenes to help mitigate whatever problems we have encountered um, because, in fact, it's beyond our control. Because we can't control this, our recommendation would be at this point to go ahead and let's cut our losses and move forward without this group so that they can understand that we're really kind of making that clear line of demarcation between us and them. And yet saying, this is what we think you should do. And we'll be here to sort of help you through the process, but we're not yet really the ones that, you know, ultimately can make that decision. It's their decision between them and the, and the third party. That's awesome, Rebecca. And I mean, this is a really great episode. Thank you so much for, for coming on. Um, if anybody, you know, um, you know, once you reach out to the Becca, we'll have an opportunity here just in a second. So that way she can um, hand out our website and, and phone numbers and whatnot. But let's recap real quick, just a lesson learned from today's episode, because I think from today's episode for me, um, one of the key pieces that I, I am, uh, I've learned from you here today is about, you know, where are we setting expectations and how clearly are we setting those from the very beginning of what people should expect out of us um, and what we should expect out of them in turn um, for what they're getting into. Because um, it's just like you said before, when you were like, hey, you know, like if, if I don't make that clear that I'm not taking responsibility for this other group, then all of a sudden I'm going to catch all the blame that Rebecca did something wrong when it's yeah. really none of my fault, but I'm going to help you, but this is what it needs to look like. And if people don't have that clearly, um, you know, stated out in front of them and repeated over and over again, then likely the person that they're talking to is the one that they think is the one that's responsible 
for everything being right or wrong. So um, I think that's just a you know, really great touch point for me today. I was wondering, did you have anything in particular that you wanted to leave the audience with, with like a, a lesson learned uh, from your story today? Yeah, I mean, I think you just you just really summarized it really well. And, you know, I just think that people need to understand when they're dealing with, you know, alternative investment strategies that they're as great as they are. And as much as I love to leverage them, we just have to understand that they're not what people are used to in the market. They're not hold, as simple as holding a stock or holding a bond. Um, they're not as obviously liquid as a stock or a bond. And it's really a caution that we have to give our clients where we're, we're encouraging them to do an alternative investment. We have to really make sure that we understand that they understand what, what the alternative side of it is, you know, because there's a lot of positives. But I think sometimes we think, and I know that this is just human nature, we think, well, if I really sort of harp on the differences, I might talk them out of it. Well, I understand that, uh, and I see that point, but at the same time, if we don't harp, harp on the differences enough, we can just really miss set expectations of our clients, and then we are the ones that are going to have to be unwinding those expectations when things do happen, like a hurricane, um, that they're just like, oh, I mean, I have an insurance deductible, and I've got to deal with you know tenants that can't be in, in the place, and you know I don't have any rent coming in, and these things happen. This is life. So real estate as great as it is, is we do ourselves a disservice if we try to make it seem like it's just so turnkey easy because these things will happen. And, and so I just think as much as nobody that is, you know, wanting to, you know, really get somebody on board with a concept that's alternative, um, likes to focus on, we, we really have to in the end, because we're going to be the ones that are, you know, on the hook if we've, if we've kind of made it seem too easy or too good to be true or something, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely, Rebecca. I think that's really like a key point with it. You know, it's, I think a lot of people are afraid to, to air out the, the bad stuff about like a, more things that they think they have, so will be put off um, by it. But the reality of the situation is, is that you'll end up, especially as professionals, and this goes for fund managers, I think, as well as for attorneys and, and for people that are building businesses, is that like, if you, if you feel like you have to hold back on the disclosures a lot of times for what it is, then you're really, all you're doing is, is like putting chips in the bank of, if anything goes sideways, I'm going to have an, a massive inferno of people that are angry. And that I haven't set expectations at all for them. I actually probably set the wrong expectations for them. You're really playing a game of saying like, I think everything is going to continue to work out perfectly in the future. And if it deviates even slightly from the rosy picture I painted, I'm going to have everybody blowing me up all at the same time. And that can basically, that can really just crumble your entire business because it can destroy your brand because you have so many people that are angry with you all at the same time. It's incredibly risky to run that way. You're always better off making less money by not qualifying as many clients, but making sure they're ultra qualified for what it is that you're putting them into, um, into it. So I just, I think that, that that's just another piece from what I was learning from you just now about, you know, where does it get really, where's the line there when it comes into the sales, right? Because yeah. part of that's trying to sell somebody an idea and it's tough to turn away uh, cash from a sale because everybody, you know, you're trying to like get your numbers up and trying to help your income and yeah. Um, but that can come at a, you know, a future cost, you know? So. Yeah. Too, too high of a price, too high of a price. I mean, that's the thing at the end of the day, the price is too high and you should just, you know, you should scare people away from your deal. <laughs> they could go <laughs> in any way wrong. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's something, yeah. right. It's like, it's like a future mortgage, right? I mean, it's exactly. like taking out future debt whenever you're doing something like that. So it's just exactly. like an investment strategy. So Rebecca, um, when people want to get in, in touch with you, you know, who are you looking to connect with and what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Um, so the, the way to get a hold of us is, uh, Walser Wealth. Walser is W-A-L-S as in Sam, E-R, walserwealth.com. Our book is, uh, my book is Wealth Unbroken and it's on amazon.com. If people just want to like read the book and learn more about my philosophy, my approach to really tax. I mean, my tax philosophy and in a nutshell, Scott can just be summed up that I am completely disgusted with conventional financial wisdom that we still hear shouted all over the country every single day, which is maximize your pre-tax wealth. I believe in contributing to pre-tax to the extent you get a free match. So I would never tell any client to walk away from free money, but beyond free money, I would tell you that an IRA, a 401k, a simple ASAP, a 457, a 403b, any of those that don't come with a match, you should absolutely consider not contributing to because taxes now are the lowest we've had since the 30s. 
So what you're choosing to do is to defer the tax when it's the lowest it's been since the 30s to pay it at some future date where the future is really, really ugly from a tax perspective. So that's sort of my tax philosophy in a nutshell. That's awesome, Rebecca. Um, everybody, that's, uh, I would get uh, recommend just going out and grabbing, uh, grabbing <laughs> going onto the Walter Wealth website and uh, grabbing a hold of the book. You know, give it a quick read um, if you get a get a chance to. Um, always unconventional wisdom is a uh, is usually probably some of the best wisdom that you could yeah. find, right? Um, yeah. You know, it's like it's one of those things. If you're following the herd, almost you're almost always wrong, especially when it comes to financial matters. Um, so thank you so much, Rebecca, for coming on the show. And of course, everybody, I am your host, Scott Royal Smith. This is the Real Estate Nerds Podcast. Um, thank you so much for joining us here today, and uh, we'll catch you again here soon. That's all for this Bad Beats episode. I'm your host, Scott Royal Smith, with the Real Estate Nerds Podcast. Did you see yourself in any part of that story? I know I did. If you enjoyed the show, leave a review to help clue in the sleeping masses of what they need to know and what we all need reminders of. Do your good deed for the day. Thanks, and I'll see you again soon.